Okay, folks, we're getting ready to start here. You should all be able to hear me through your computer. Uh, ben and Joe, are you there? We are here. Uh, I'm here as well. Of administrative th first of all, a uh, uh, couple little administrative things. You've got uh, a a window, a chat window in the lower left-hand corner of your screen where you can post questions or comments or whatever as the webinar goes on. Uh, typically after I finish speaking, and I'm going to do the first few slides on this, uh, I try and answer those as it goes. You can't see each other's, but I can see everybody's. And so I, I try and do as many of those, especially the ones that pop up uh, frequently, I try and answer those as, much, as many as possible during the the seminar, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to submit questions after the seminar, uh, and I'll give you the name right now, the email address right now is contact at crpa.org, where you should uh, submit uh, uh, follow-up questions or comments or suggestions or whatever. Um, ben, anything else we want to talk about administratively here before we get the show on the road? No, I think that's, that's good. Okay, so uh, let's get started. It is noon. Uh, we've got a, a number of people on the line, not as many as registered. Uh, by the way, I do apologize if those poll questions for some of you late registrants were a uh, bit of a pain. Uh, we're trying to get that information because we can kind of tailor these webinars to, um, to the audience that's that wants them, uh, and can, we're happy to do lots more webinars if there's a demand for them. Um, so uh, in the future, I think sort of the price of admission will be you have to fill out those poll questions before you can complete the registration. For those of you who registered before we put those poll questions in, you'll be getting an email after the seminar, after the webinar, asking you uh, to answer those poll questions. I would have really appreciated if you guys would if you folks would uh, answer those, it really helps us uh, to figure out who we're, who we're talking to and what we should be talking to them about. So jumping to our, our first slide, what we're talking about today is the Newsom, Gavin Newsom Ballot Initiative, Prop 63. What does it do and how will it change California's firearms laws? My name is Chuck Michelle. I'm senior partner at Michelle and Associates. With me on the line today is Ben Machada, who is my, uh, one of my legal associates, and Joe Silvoso, who is the Regulatory Compliance Counsel for Michelle & Associates, the law firm at which we all work. Uh, Michelle & Associates does a lot of work for the National Rifle Association and the California Rifle and Pistol Association, as well as gun owners, uh, uh, Retailer, FFLs, retailers, wholesalers, manufacturers. I mean, we're, we, we cover the entire firearms industry. We also do other types of legal work. Uh, check us out there at michellelawyers.com. You can see our employment law practice, environmental practice, and things like that. And we appreciate anybody's business in any of those areas. Um, the NRA and the CRPA are the ones who pr produced the, the webinar for your uh, education today. As you can see, we have 38 slides. This is slide two, so you can kind of keep track of how quickly we're moving today. So our objectives today are to give you folks an overview of Prop 63 campaign activities. That means how this thing gets started and what, have, uh, what groups have been doing what to, uh, to oppose it. And then we're going to get into an analysis of the Prop 63 legal components and what those laws will do. So I'm going to talk about the overview of the campaign activities and then Joe is going to get into those, those components of Prop 63 and what exactly uh, it does if it passes. Uh, first, let me say, and I know it's, uh, forgive me for the lawyer language here, but I do need to say that uh, this webinar doesn't create a legal uh, relationship between any listener and the law firm. We're not, it doesn't create an attorney-client relationship. And uh, this, this seminar is not formally considered to be legal advice. It's an educational webinar that I think uh, you'll find very useful, but it's not, uh, you, you can't sue me if I'm wrong. Uh, 
So you can read that uh, at, at your leisure. This will all be, by the way, all of this webinar will be posted on the CRPA, California Rifle and Pistol Association's website, uh, and you can watch it again. And when you watch it again, you can stop the slides and, and linger and uh, read all the, the details of this disclaimer. I'm sure everybody's very interested in doing that. Okay, what is the California Rifle and Pistol Association? Forgive me if I take a minute and just give you a spiel here. I am now the volunteer president of the California Rifle and Pistol Association. It's the state association of the National Rifle Association governed by its own board of directors and, uh, uh, and responsible for uh, many different things in the state of California as that state association and also as its own standalone entity. Uh, a lot, we were very involved, CRPA is very involved politically as well as getting people out to the range and training them to uh, safely and enjoyably uh, use firearms at the, at the range uh, or, or, or for hunting or uh, for any other legal purpose, including and certainly not limited to self-defense or defending your family. Uh, so we're very involved in all components in California, and I've been the vo volunteer president for 18 months, and that association, uh, now that it no longer has the previous executive director, has really turned a corner and is an entirely different entity. I hope you guys will take a look at it. Uh, and uh, consider uh, joining and, and being part of it. They are very involved in, in lots of things out here, including uh, things that the NRA and the CRPA do jointly, which is legislative advocacy. They each have a, a uh, legislative advocate in Sacramento. I know that uh, uh, those guys have an uphill battle considering how the legislature is stacked these days, uh, but they and, and Sam Paredes from the Gun Owners of California and, uh, and uh, 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 Craig Deleuz from Firearms Policy Center uh, and some other folks that are up there either full-time or part-time. The full-time guys are Dan Reed from NRA, Roy Griffith from CRPA, and uh, Sam Paredes from GOC uh, are up there doing their best. Uh, but they depend on, on grassroots support to be able to be effective. So. We really need to have everybody involved in order to make their voices heard. Uh, they, we're also involved in local ordinance monitoring and opposition when local ordinances uh, come up uh, and more and more cities, especially the, uh, you know, the progressive uh, uh, inclined cities, are, are buying into uh, trying to do local gun control ordinances. We watch the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and make sure that their hunting regulations are are, uh, promote the, the North American model of game management, which is sustainable hunting, as opposed to what some of the anti-hunting groups are trying to do in banning hunting altogether and reintroducing predators, like let coyotes and grizzly bears run wild to uh, control um, the, the game herds, so you don't need hunters anymore. Firearm regulations at the California Department of Justice Firearms Bureau, uh, those folks are, are very subject to political influence, unfortunately, and often do things that are hostile to gun, manu uh, to gun owners, uh, but much like the federal ATF is inclined to do, depending on who's in the White House. Uh, CRPA, I mentioned, very much involved in, in promoting shooting programs and gun safety and education training programs. Uh, CRPA just opened a training center in Fullerton where we're putting on classes all the time, uh, and, uh, and, and we're, just, we're trying to get people out to the range and pulling triggers. The more people that go out and shoot, the more they will know about uh, some of the uh, misinformation that's out there about guns and gun owners and, and can help us fight back and become part of the grassroots volunteers uh, effort. Uh, we are, the CRPA is uh, putting together a, a grassroots coalition of uh, different groups in different, uh, lo in different counties and also working with the NRA members councils uh, to, uh, to try and be uh, effective at the local level, and there's a lot of information about that on CRPA's website. We're also involved in elections and campaigns like the ones um, uh, you're listening to right now or, or we're going to be talking about right now, and we're involved in litigation uh, advancing the right to keep and bear arms and protecting and defending the Second Amendment and, uh, and, and hopefully expanding the protections of the Second Amendment. Um, and limiting government infringement on your right to keep and bear arms. So uh, getting into the Prop 63 campaign overview, Prop 63 was, was basically written by 
uh, the law firm for the gun ban lobby. That's the law center to prevent gun violence, in San, not surprisingly, in San Francisco. Uh, those lawyers have basically never met a gun control law they didn't like. They've advocated on behalf of complete civilian disarmament and, and, and take away all civilian handguns and take away, uh, well, just about anything. Um, unfortunately, California is sort of the petri dish for, for gun control initiatives, and Prop 63 is no exception. Uh, and these are some of the players that are involved in financing this. You can sort of see uh, from the folks who gave the most money here uh, that uh, the, the sort of the usual suspects, although wisely on the bottom there is a Republican, oddly enough, but the rest are uh, right in there in the, you know, the, the billionaire or multimillionaire elitist sort of uh, club where they uh, think they know how to tell folks how to live their lives and, and are not afraid to write checks to help people, like in this case Gavin Newsom, <clears throat> who launched this campaign because he wants to run for go is running for governor in 2018, and this is a way for him to get his name recognition up because name recognition across the state uh, is, is very important to winning a state right office, and all he has is uh, recognition as lieutenant governor, which doesn't give you much, and recognition as San Francisco's mayor, not all of which was good. Uh, so, but this gives you an idea of who the players are and how this got started. It again is really it's a, it's a campaign, part of Newsom's campaign for governor, and that's why you can see he. I, I suspect that 727 564 is a loan from his governor's campaign war chest to this to the Prop 63 war chest to the Prop 63 uh, campaign. Uh, uh. So a bit on California's campaign finance laws. Nonprofit associations like the CRPA or the National Rifle Association or the Gun Owners of California or any other 501c3 or c4 entity, they are limited in the number, in, in the amount of money that they can spend on campaigns in a year. $50,000 is the maximum amount that a nonprofit can spend on campaigns, not just a campaign, all campaigns in one year period. Uh, if it spends more than that, if one of those nonprofits spends more than that, it jeopardizes the privacy of its membership information because once you spend more than $50,000, the law, the campaign finance laws, treat the, associ the nonprofit association as a PAC in its own right and all the disclosure rules get kicked in. The, the, the purpose of this whole campaign finance law is to disclose who's financing uh, elections. That's why you see all those big donors on the previous page. They had to disclose their information. Well, uh, the NRA, the CRPA, GOC all contributed the $50,000 max about, uh, uh, over a, about a, a little over a year ago, uh, and now for 2016 have been maxed out, which is why they have not been able to spend direct money on uh, things like Veto Gun Mageddon or any other campaign. They all put it all into Prop 63. And they were ready to put more in. Uh, both NRA and the National Shooting Sports Foundation have a federal PAC, which uh, has a different set of reporting requirements and which uh, subject to some fairly significant tax penalties, could have diverted sentiments, put more money into uh, pr uh, opposing Prop 63. They did do some fundraisers, in, uh, mailings into California to help raise money. But what all these nonprofits have to basically do is become what might be called a bundler uh, because they can't donate more than $50,000 from money that they got from members or donations to the 50C3. 501c4 directly, they have to funnel their members. They, 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 are, they are not required to report their communications with their members, and so you're, you should be all, if you're members of the NRA, seeing emails from the NRA saying, please contribute to the Coalition for Civil Liberties. So they can direct people to donate to the PAC, and they can uh, donate $50,000 themselves, but beyond that, if they donate anything else from the nonprofit association, they run the risk of making their donor information public. And no, none of the donors want that, and certainly none of the associations are going to put that information at risk. So the member groups of the Coalition for Civil Liberties joined together 
to pool their recess, re resources and protect their private information. So you can learn more about the coalitions at that website. Now here's one thing that may, may uh, have some importance to some of you folks. Uh, uh, the California finance laws, an individual can donate an unlimited, uh, you know, there's no cap on your donation. And, and most significantly, unlike federal PACs, under the California PAC laws, corporations can donate in the name of the corporation. So you can write a company check. Uh, it's not tax deductible, but it, usually on the federal level, you can't write a company check. You can't write a corporate check. And so a lot of times the executives that run, you know, uh, a, a gun company or an ammunition company or a company that just believes in the right to self-defense, uh, they have to donate individually as personal donations rather than a corporate donation. That, that, gives us, that does give us some ability uh, to raise money um, a little more easily because those corporations don't have that restriction. Uh, and so a lot of people have joined the Coalition for Civil Liberty and it works better, uh, really, to have all those groups working together. You can see the civil rights organizations in the lower right-hand corner there. Uh, you've got CRPA, NRA, uh, the Pink Pistols, which is the LGBT group. That was fun getting them involved. That really gave Gavin Newsom some heartburn, um, which uh, I love giving him heartburn. Yeah, you can see these other groups. Also, the uh, I want to make sure I give a shout-out to the uh, – California Waterfowl Association, which is a uh, donor and a, and a member. Most significantly is the law enforcement organizations. You've got county sheriffs and all the major law enforcement advocacy groups, the associations in the state. They are united in their opposition to this. Um, and that's, that's a unique uh, development in uh, the political uh, uh, arena here. Uh, these police uh, a lot of times are criticized because some of these police groups go out and they get an exception to a law for police, and then they stop opposing the law. Well, I think that's really changing in light of the, some of the political uh, developments and the way police are being disrespected and, and murdered uh, across the country now. And uh, they're seeing that some of the, uh, the agenda, the Democratic or the uh, liberal progressive agenda, uh, doesn't jive with uh, their view of the world. And so... Uh, whereas before it might have been a union issue and they were lining up with the Democrats, now it's more of a vote fee to freedom first kind of a thing, which the NRA has uh, used as a, a campaign pitch for, uh, for quite a while. So we're very proud of the fact that we pulled those law enforcement officers and those sheriffs together, and we look forward to working them with them as part of the coalition even after uh, the November 8th election. The coalition will go on. It will be hopefully be the go-to pack for political activities in the state of California, and you will be seeing, if you're an NRA or a CRPA or a GOC or a member of any of these other groups, you'll be seeing us trying to raise the money, you know, the right color of money, so to speak, the, the, the money that can be used for political campaigns, which has to go through a PAC. And so uh, I think this coalition model uh, works well. I'm, I'm trying to actually push that for CRPA. In other areas, I mentioned the grassroots uh, a local grassroots group uh, coalition that we're putting together, and we also have a hunting and conservation coalition where we have all the stakeholders that are involved in, in that issue uh, working together as a coalition. For, so CRPA is trying to be sort of the umbrella for all of these type of groups and, and, and all the things that these groups have in common across the state. So moving on now to uh, the legal components. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Joe, and I will take a look at some of the questions that came in while I was talking and see if I can't post some answers to those. You guys may not see the question, so I will try and summarize the question and then give the answer if I can uh, in, the, uh, in the chat box on the bottom there. So Joe, take it from here. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, good to have you back. For those of you who have been around previously for any of the other webinars relating to the bills that were signed back in July um, and are going into effect next year. Uh, I'm not going to be covering those in detail. Those webinars can be found at the CRPA's uh, website. Um, I will be discussing some of the potential crossover um, and how they are dealt with or what other issues um, Prop 63 
um, is going to cover um, that those already do, uh, potential conflicts between the two. Um, so there is that, but nevertheless, um, for things like assault weapons, I'm not going to be handling those. Um, that's not in Prop 63. I saw at least one question relating to assault weapons. I'm not going to be addressing um, assault weapons today, um, but you can go ahead and check that out um, in the previous assault weapon webinar at the CRPA uh, website. This is specific to Prop 63 and what if it is voted on and passes this coming November, what it will do. Um, going down the list kind of how um, the bill is written, we are going down the slides in a similar fashion. Um, some of them, uh, some of the information we will be skipping, we're not going to get very vendor specific. Um, so those specific requirements that were relates to um, ammunition to vendors uh, later on, I'm not going to get into far into the weeds with how do you get the vendor license and what that covers and your employees' requirements. Um, the, purposes of, the purpose of this uh, webinar is for most California citizens who have questions and covering the legal aspects of those. Also for purposes of time and brevity, we're not going into the weeds um, uh, in all of Prop 63 and its many um, in-depth requirements. Uh, this is an overview. Uh, when I can, um, we've uh, summarized um, some of the exceptions and requirements, um, but most certainly that information can be found in the proposition itself. And if it does pass, um, we are currently finalizing the fourth edition of Chuck's book, California Gun Laws. Uh, that will, if Prop 63 passes, include all that information. Hopefully it doesn't. Then there's a lot of deleting we will need to do. Um, but we've already taken that into consideration in writing the fourth edition. Um, all of the laws that have um, passed back in July. Those are addressed there as well in great detail already. And like I said, if Prop 63 passes, all that information can be found there. And then if, for those of you who asked already, um, and Chuck has already addressed it once, but this webinar will, like the ones that preceded it concerning the July bills, uh, those will be on the CRPA website. But starting at the top of Prop 63, as it relates to most things, is the theft loss reporting. Uh, we've seen versions of this requirement uh, be proposed and actually vetoed a couple of times uh, by Governor Brown uh, when they were brought up in the years past. Nevertheless, um, Ms. Newsom and um, the gun ban lobby have decided to tuck this requirement into um, Prop 63, which as of July 1, 2017, um, if you have your firearm lost or stolen, you're required to report that firearm lost or stolen within five days of you knowing or reasonably should have known uh, that the firearm was lost or stolen. You've got to report that to law enforcement. And the flip side of that, of course, is if you end up finding it again, oh wait, it was under the bed, and I thought it was in the safe, and it's not. Um, you're required to let law enforcement know of that as well. Um, those who don't have to report, if you're a member of law enforcement, you're reporting it through um, your agency, armed forces, um, similar. If you lose a firearm in um, the armed forces, you have to require it, or you're required to um, report it to the branch in which you're um, enlisted in. Um, of course, um, firearms Manufacturers and dealers and importers have their own separate requirements under federal law to report lost and stolen firearms. In fact, there's also additional requirements under California law uh, that require that as well. Um, and so they're not subject to this law in particular, but they are subject to both federal and state laws relating to dealers, manufacturers, and importers specifically. And then, of course, if you lost a firearm 20 years ago, come July 1st, you're not going to have to report that sucker stolen or lost at that point. It's just from July 1st, 2017 and moving forward is the reporting requirements. Um, penalties for failing to do this, um, the first two times it happens, it's an infraction. You pay a fine, much like a speeding ticket, and that's about it. Uh, third time's the charm, as is often the case when it comes to heightened punishments, whether it's three strikes or this. Um, you can be charged with a misdemeanor um, that could carry with a jail time um, and a fine as well. Um, if you continue to lose things and fail to report them um, at a time when you're supposed to or law enforcement thinks you should have done it by. Um, what needs to be reported, this is interesting in that what needs to be reported, make, model, serial number, um, if you know those things. But look at the quoted language. Um, any additional relevant information required by the local law enforcement agency taking the firearm? As it says below that, I don't know what that is. 
um, and what additional information a law enforcement agency could ask you for. If they start getting into the weeds uh, relating to the where for why and how you acquired the firearm, from whom, when, um, I would have some serious concerns as both a regulatory compliance attorney and a criminal defense attorney um, that my client is providing information that may be a violation of his or her Fifth Amendment rights. Um, we don't know how law enforcement agencies are going to proceed with this and whatever this additional relevant information is supposed to be, um, but most certainly um, if we start seeing in practice that they're starting to push firearm owners and, and, and unfortunately people who are the victim of crime in some instances, instances um, for additional information, um, keep in mind that we and through the CRPA and the NRA would be more than happy to um, remind law enforcement officers of the Fifth Amendment and the requirements relating to those. There is also a provision that is existing um, now under the July bills um, that re it makes it illegal for you to um, knowingly um, and um, inappropriately or falsely uh, reporting your firearm lost and stolen, keeping in mind, as I mentioned before, um, that uh, falsely reporting a crime is already a crime in the state of California. I guess the Lieutenant Governor just wants to drive that home, um, but uh, the false uh, reporting of your firearm being lost, that's um, in this, as it is already in existing California law. Uh, that's pending next year as a result of the July bills. The other interesting thing about this is Prop 63 makes these violations, the false reporting of the firearm uh, lost or stolen, an infraction, whereas current California law and the bills that passed last July um, make them uh, misdemeanors. And so uh, thanks, Lieutenant Governor, you're making criminals or people who lie to law enforcement about their firearms um, being lost or stolen um, get infractions versus more serious offenses. Uh, I'm certain that's an error on their part and an egregious one at that, but that's kind of the attention to detail um, in some of these laws that we will see um, that are pending uh, the, the Californians vote um, and how much effort they put into writing them. And so, um, again, good job, Lieutenant Governor. You've made uh, a crime lesser for those people who are going to do the bad thing. And moving forward, uh, the, we've always had concerns relating to when you know, or more particularly, when you should have known your firearm is lost and stolen, what that should have known means. Uh, for instance, if I'm storing firearms in two locations and I don't visit that other location all that often, and I go up to visit it on a weekend and lo and behold, my, my location or my home has been broken into, and the firearms have been stolen. I don't know how long those firearms have been gone for. Uh, they might very well be longer than those five days that the law requires me to report them in. And then in reporting them, I don't know whether or not law enforcement is going to say, well, good job, thank you for reporting them, or saying, hey, buddy, you should know where your firearms all are at all times. And as a result, if this break-in took place more than five days ago, well, you should have reported long before now. Um, we don't know necessarily how long enforcement is going to react to that as well. As a result, um, if there's a delay in your reporting the firearms lost or stolen, as the bottom discusses, uh, you might want to discuss your situation with an attorney who uh, it's sad that law-abiding gun owners who want to do the right thing and report their firearm lost or stolen are having to give an attorney a call and say, hey, um, I didn't realize there was this wait uh, or this requirement that I report my firearms quickly to law enforcement is lost or stolen, or um, I just missed the time and delayed beyond my five days, but I'd really like to do the right thing here and report my firearms lost and stolen, um, but I need you to discuss with law enforcement whether or not they're going to be interested in citing me um, for that violation of California law. Um, you shouldn't have to get an attorney in the middle of you doing the right thing and reporting your firearms lost and stolen, but that's unfortunately uh, what the Lieutenant Governor has decided to put in his proposition. Uh, moving forward, we see um, another already violation of California law as of July 1st, um, at least when it was passed, um, rear its head, and that's the so-called large capacity magazine ban. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are restrictions currently on so-called large capacity magazines, and those are magazines 
capable of accepting more than 10 rounds. Um, however, the, the ban or the restriction, at least under state law, it doesn't extend to possession. And so there are already restrictions in place on the importation and manufacturing um, and the receiving and buying of large capacity magazines, to name just a few of the um, activities that are restricted. Um, but for those of you who have had them, the possession of these magazines is not illegal, at least not yet under current law. Um, and if it's passed in, uh, in, in Prop 63, um, it will most certainly be a violation as well. Um, come July 1, 2017, it will be what's known as a wobblet under California law, meaning the violation can be prosecuted as a felon, I'm sorry, as a misdemeanor or an infraction for you to possess magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. And as that second portion says, uh, Governor Brown, that's one of the bills he signed back in July. However, that violation um, makes possession only an infraction for repeat violations, and unlike the three-strike issue I mentioned before, uh, no matter how many violations you have of the, or concerning the restriction of possession of large capacity magazines under the July bill, um, it will remain an infraction. Unfortunately for us under Prop 63, if that does pass, um, those in possession of large capacity magazines come July 1st of next year can be prosecuted for a misdemeanor, um, which causes me some area of concern because there are jurisdictions in California, let's just call them not so gun friendly, um, who would jump at the chance for filing a misdemeanor charge uh, for people unknowingly or unintentionally violating the restriction on large capacity magazines. Um, and while a violation of this code section doesn't automatically carry with it a firearm restriction, it's not unusual for prosecutors uh, to seek some type of firearm restriction as a result of a misdemeanor conviction involving a firearm or some type of firearm um, part or accessory, like, I don't know, a large capacity magazine. Um, so be mindful of that. There are options available um, for you if you were to possess uh, those magazines now. Um, they're listed down below. You can still get them the heck out of Dodge and remove them from the state. Um, you can always sell a large capacity magazine to a licensed firearm dealer. Licensed firearm dealers, regardless of them having a large capacity magazine permit, um, and are exempt from acquiring them, although if they're acquiring them from outside the state, they have to have a permit. But you can sell those large capacity magazines um, to law enforcement, um, and as the options given to you in Prop 63 layout, um, you can always surrender them to a law enforcement agency for destruction if you were to decide to go that route. Um, one thing they don't throw out, and I always throw out as an area of uh, advice, um, if you wanted to convert your large capacity magazine, and I would suggest doing this prior to the election, and most certainly if this ban doesn't take place prior to January 1st of this coming year, if you wanted to convert your large capacity magazine to permanently alter it so that the magazine cannot accept more than 10 rounds, that as far as I'm concerned is a viable option. These aren't the laws yet. Um, the the uh, California public still has the ability to vote on Prop 63, and um, the July bill doesn't go into effect until January 1st, keeping in mind that the ban doesn't go into effect until July 1st of next year. Um, but you still have some options with respect to your currently lawfully possessed large capacity magazines about what you want to do and how you want to go about it. Um, other exceptions um, to this restriction, um, most of the exceptions that exist for the legal so-called law uh, unlawful activities relating to large capacity magazines are still there. And so there are still exceptions for law enforcement agencies and peace officers and those who sell to uh, law enforcement agencies and peace officers and members of the military, um, or I should say um, military agencies. Um, they still have exceptions in place with respect to the large capacity magazine uh, ban. Um, most of those exceptions have been expanded by both the July bill and um, Prop 63 to include um, exceptions for possession on large capacity magazine. Um, the Prop 63 also expands the extensions or expands the exception uh, for federal law enforcement. Oddly enough, under the current restrictions on large capacity magazine, <laughs> our friends in um, federal law enforcement, FBI, ATF, aren't exempt from the restrictions on buying or receiving large capacity magazines. Um, that was obviously an oversight by those in Sacramento 
Um, again, kind of giving you an idea of how thorough they are sometimes when they write these laws. Um, but both the July bill and um, Prop 63 extends the ex exceptions to federal law enforcement so they, like their peace officer brethren um, who are law enforcement officers in the state of California, uh, they too then can acquire and purchase um, large capacity magazines. Um, under this except under the prop 63 there is an exception uh, for the possession uh, by honorably retired sworn peace officers in California um, and federal uh, law enforcement officers who are authorized to carry firearms but keep in mind that that exception is for possession only once peace officers retire once federal law enforcement officers retire they are banned or prohibited from acquiring new ones in the state of California However, they can keep the ones they already have. So anybody in law enforcement um, who's planning on uh, retiring anytime soon, uh, you guys might want to buy as many large cap mags as you can because you won't be able to once you retire. Um, so bear that in mind. And last but not least, Prop 63 does something which I would classify as a little bit silly um, because it ends up giving these retired law enforcement officers a bit of a hard time. Uh, it removes the exception for somebody taking the magazine out of the state and bringing it back in. Because bringing that magazine back in is arguably importation. But like I just said, retired law enforcement officers are only exempt from the restrictions on possession. In other words, if a retired law enforcement officer would take a magazine outside of the state and then bring it back in, they would arguably be importing it and as a result violating California law because they've just deleted that exception. So another thing for law enforcement officers to be a little bit concerned about concerning Prop 63, mind you there are a bunch of others, uh, which no doubt is also part of the reason amongst many others as well. Um, we have so many law enforcement agencies who've gotten on the bandwagon um, to support um, a no on 63 a vote. Um, that's large capacity magazines. Um, ammunition. Um, Thank you for those who suffered through the ammunition webinar that we've recently done, but uh, if you haven't, um, get ready for some more. Um, what we've seen with respect especially to ammunition is a butting of heads, so to speak, between the Lieutenant Governor and the Senate Pro Tem, Senator De Leon, over who is um, better when it comes to banning firearms and ammunition in the state of California. And if you want some interesting reading, um, go ahead and do some looking around, particularly to LA Times articles, um, of how these two have at least very politely told each other to go F themselves. Uh, because it's, it's really interesting to watch uh, two politicians from the same party try to one-up one another when it comes to banning things and infringing on people's rights. Um, so uh, go ahead and check it out. There have been a, uh, letters exchanged. There's been a war of words in the media and the press conferences between the two about who is the bigger gun banner in the state of California. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a toss-up right now between the two, um, really just because of how bad this is. And um, Senator DeLeon has a whole body of work uh, when it comes to restricting uh, Second Amendment rights, and so um, we'll see who prevails uh, coming November. Uh, nevertheless, what Senator De Leon did in his bill, uh, Senate 1235, which it was one of those bills that passed back in July, was that he did a kind of an either-or situation when it came to his bill. He basically wrote it in a way that says, if Newsom's Prop 63 is enacted, only portions of his bill go into effect. And if Prop 63 doesn't pass, a whole slew of other sections go into effect. And I covered that whole slew of other sections um, in the previous webinar, and I touched upon uh, what the differences would be um, if Newsom, Newsom passes, um, but I'll address those as well. Um, but nevertheless, Senator De Leon did try to one-up the Lieutenant Governor in changing and modifying Prop 63 um, to things he wanted to have happen uh, versus the requirements specifically laid out in Prop 63, keeping in mind that both are horrible. Um, but nevertheless, he tried to change Prop 63 even before it was voted on um, and would go into effect if passes. Um, it remains to be seen what exactly and how exactly this is going to play out, partly because 
One, Prop 63 does allow for the legislature to modify the, the laws that it creates if it were to pass. However, the Lieutenant Governor has come out and said that what Senator De Leon has done is not in the spirit of Prop 63. Um, we potentially may see a fight between the two if Prop 63 were to pass. I don't think that's necessarily likely, uh, but nevertheless, they are still having a bit of a back and forth concerning whose law is supposed to be the one that prevails and um, what will be the law in California if Prop 63 were to pass. Obviously, if Prop 63 doesn't pass, we are still dealing with and we're living in a SB 1235 world, all of those requirements. Uh, that are in that section or those sections that become operative if Prop 63 doesn't pass. Uh, we're still facing like the vendor requirements and the background checks and things like that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, one way or another, we're going to have some ammo issues coming to us in California. And when I mention ammo um, or ammunition, what are we really talking about here when it comes to almost all of this stuff? Um, and that information, um, regardless of it being Prop 63, or um, for Senator De Leon's bill, um, it deals with the same thing. Ammunition is defined as one or more loaded cartridges consisting of the prime case propellant and with one or more projectiles. And in other words, we're, we're dealing with the fully assembled cartridge. We're not dealing with, when we're, come, when we're talking about the requirements of a vendor license and background checks and providing personal information on purchasing ammunition and all of that stuff, with one exception, and I'll mention that in a second, we're not dealing with the components of ammunition. So if we're talking about the actual projectiles or the bullet or primers or the propellant, all of those components are not covered in the restrictions relating to the vendor license and the background check and um, all of that other stuff. And so a lot of people have asking, well, what about reloaders? How does this affect them? Really not that much because at this point all of these requirements I'm about ready to get into and all of those requirements I went into when I was talking specifically about SB 1235 during that previous webinar, those are for completed cartridges, not the components of ammunition. And the only real aspect of when components come into play um, is for purposes of this um, because Prop 63 and SB 1235 created a new violation of California law, and it's illegal for anybody to sell or supply ammunition to another person knowing that they're doing so on behalf or has caused to believe that they're doing so on behalf of a prohibited person. So if a dealer is selling ammunition, or I should more accurately say a vendor is selling ammunition to somebody and they have a bad feeling about this or they outright know that this person is buying that ammunition for somebody who's prohibited and they go through that sale anyway, that would be a violation of these new laws. That would include bullets and casings, well, bullets at least. Um, it also include magazines, clips, and speed loaders and the like because the definition of ammunition for purposes of this slide and this restriction only that I'm talking about here covers both the bullets meaning the projectiles, and clips, magazines, and speed loaders. Everything else I'm going to be talking about here, from here on out, is going to cover the complete cartridge or shell. So keep that in mind in moving forward. We do and have gotten a lot of questions relating to um, reloaders and the components, and so I just want to make that clear um, again uh, what that's going to require and cover. Um, but much like SB 1235, um, come January 1st, 2018, uh, you're going to need to acquire ammunition from, or ammunition is going to need to go through an ammunition vendor. Uh, when either party to a sale of ammunition um, has a vendor's license, you're going to need to go through a vendor as well, much like California's private party transfer requirements when it comes to uh, firearms, you're going to have that same situation if I wanted to sell ammunition to, to anybody else in my office. Um, we would need to go down to a vendor to conduct that transaction um, through that vendor. And as the next slide um, will show, the same thing from having um, ammunition shipped to you, requiring ammunition from outside the state, we'll need to go through a vendor as well, very much uh, along the lines of SB 1235. This requirement as well will take place on January 1st, 2018. 
So if you're ordering that ammunition from outside of the state or you're just purchasing ammunition as well, you have a face-to-face -face requirement and you need to have that um, ammunition shipped to a vendor prior to um, you receiving that ammunition um, in California come January 1, 2018. Um, there are some limited exceptions to um, these requirements. Um, some of the usual suspects uh, when it comes to the vendor requirements and the face-to-face -face, um, restrictions um, apply. You still see law enforcement officers and sworn peace officers, um, importers, manufacturers of ammunition, um, you get your vendors, you have consultant evaluators. You have the target facility is back again as an exception. Um, and the language is very similar to um, SB 1235, um, the target facility holding a business or other regulatory license. But again, the same restrictions as I've mentioned before for target facilities still apply. That ammunition is going to have to stay on site. Um, for them to be, for that facility to be exempt from having to get a vendor's license. Uh, we saw that same exception and the same requirement under SB 1235 in that um, target facilities are going to be exempt from the vendor license requirement if that ammunition is kept on site. Um, if that target facility wants to sell ammunition and allow the purchaser of that ammunition to take that ammunition any place else but their facility, then that target facility will need to get a vendor license as well. Um, what we don't see here, which was prevalent in SB 1235, are all the exemptions uh, for uh, hunting organizations and nonprofits. Um, not there under SB 63. And so um, this is a little bit more narrow exception-wise than De Leon's bill was, and so as a result, you don't have the same exemptions for hunting organizations um, as it's laid out in um, SB 1235 or the nonprofit exemption um, that was previously in SB 1235. And so we have that um, a more fun and excitement, <laughs> if you can call it that, as a result of SB 63. Uh, that we do not have, and unfortunately, um, 1235 um, has a little bit more broader of an exception scope. Um, same thing um, from SB 23 we see again in Prop 63. You still have, as I commonly refer to it, and I'll continue to do so, um, the uh, razor blade requirements um, for ammo sellers. Um, and that if you go to um, your supermarket and you want to buy razor blades, you, have, you usually have to have um, somebody who's an employee, go ahead and access those and give them and let you look at them at that point. Same thing with ammunition. It's going to have to be inaccessible to the purchaser, um, and they're going to have to keep them either locked up in cages or some way um, out of the purchaser's hands prior to selling them that ammunition or behind the counter. And as I mentioned before, for SB 1235, if, you're, if you've been into a gun store recently, you know they don't exactly have all that great amount of room behind the counter or probably don't want to foot the expense of having to get cages or something else uh, to put that ammunition behind. But uh, if Prop 63 passes, that's going to be the requirement, and it unfortunately already is the requirement under SB 1235. Um, ammunition registration, again, almost identical to um, uh, 1235, um, but a few differences. Um, 1235's format and requirements are all electronic. Um, Prop 63 does contemplate a form having to be filled out and one that you eventually have to sign um, in order to acquire the ammunition, but a lot of the same information that is required to be kept um, is still there. In addition to that, you still have the requirement that this information gets sent off to California Department of Justice up in Sacramento to keep that information under Prop 63 forever. Unlike Prop, I'm sorry, uh, SB 1235, which only allows DOJ to keep that information for two years, um, Prop 63 has no end date with respect to your information. So the transfer date, um, your driver's license ID number, the brand type, amount of ammunition you purchase, uh, your name, where you live, date of birth, all that information can be kept by DOJ forever, which it's pretty stupid considering that ammunition um, is made to be used, and once it's used, it's kind of hard to get back. Um, and so if law enforcement were ever to follow up and say, hey, where's that ammunition you purchased 
a day, a month, a year ago. Well, guys, so you can go to the berm outside of the range that I was shooting and start looking for you there, but I have no idea what the heck you're talking about. Um, it's been all used up at that point. Uh, the other part of Prop 63 and that difference differs from De Leon's bill. Um, under De Leon's bill, um, the vendor cannot provide your information to anyone other than law enforcement uh, for law enforcement purposes. Um, in Prop 63, a vendor cannot sell, disclose, or share your information to anyone else without your written consent. And so there is the ability of the vendor to share your information um, that they acquired uh, when you purchase the ammunition, however they need your consent. Uh, under the daily own bill, uh, that's a straight no-no unless it's for law enforcement. Um, authorized ammunition purchasers. This is by far the biggest distinction when it comes at least to ammunition between the daily own bill and the Newsom initiative. I keep on calling that, but it's probably more accurate to say it's Prop 63 at this point. Um, Prop 63. Um, at least under Prop 63, um, there is the requirement that you obtain a permit prior to purchasing ammunition. And I'll talk about how Senator De Leon's tried to change that, um, but at least as with the proposition and how the proposition reads is that come January 1st, 2019, you'll have the ability to apply for a permit in order for you to be able to purchase the ammunition. And you'll have to have that permit, and the permit will be required from you come July 1, 2019. Uh, the only real exception to that for most Californians is uh, that if you're purchasing a firearm at the same time uh, you're acquiring the ammunition, you've in theory already done the background check for the firearm, so what's the big deal about not having a permit? We'll give you the ammunition to go with that firearm as well. Um, that's really the only exception to this requirement. Prop, I'm sorry, um, De Leon's bill, SB 1235, has contemplated or at least considered, well, what happens when you don't have or somebody um, isn't able to do the background check or have the firearm um, in the automated firearm system, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, at least under De Leon's bill, you have the ability to do a background or one-time background check at the time of purchasing ammunition. Um, but unfortunately, under Prop 63, that's not there. And so if somebody has an emergency, if somebody needs to um, purchase a, uh, ammunition at a short notice and they don't already have one of these things, well, tough buddy, you're not going to be able to buy this ammunition um, from or acquire it from a vendor without you getting that permit ahead of time. Um, again, one of those situations where the people writing this didn't really take all things into consideration when it came to putting this thing down. Um, but unfortunately, unless you're buying a gun at the same time, you're going to have to wait, get processed for, and get that permit prior to acquiring uh, the, uh, the ammunition. And again, a lot of the exceptions for the um, authorization permit come into play. You get the ammo vendors and dealers, uh, gunsmiths and wholesalers. Um, law enforcement, sorry guys, you kind of get screwed on this one, and here's why. If you're a member of law enforcement, federal or state, and you want to acquire ammunition without having to have that stupid permit, and I'm sorry, it's stupid, um, you have to get written authorization from the head of your agency prior to do that. Um, I don't know how many heads of law enforcement agencies are too keen to keep on writing um, authorization letters for their members or their employees every time they want to go buy ammunition to go shoot at a range. Um, but nevertheless, that's the only exception when it comes to peace officers and federal law enforcement officers when it comes to this stuff. Um, there is no exception for retired law enforcement officers. Sorry, guys, you're treated just like the rest of us. Um, enjoy the permitting process. But nevertheless, even for current law enforcement officers, you have that permitting process. I'm sorry, you have that, well, I didn't actually misspeak. You have that permitting process, or you need to bug the head of your agency to provide you a letter every single time you want to purchase ammunition. And again, I can't imagine too many heads of agencies who are keen on doing that, but that's still a requirement. Um, so bear that in mind in moving forward. And again, probably yet another reason why we have so many members of law enforcement who are willing to be uh, of assistance when it comes to these, uh, to Prop 63. Um, what that 
authorization is and does. It's good for four years, and because it's required as of July 1, 2019, even if you get it ahead of time, it takes effect on July 1, 2019. Is it good for four years beyond that, or if you get it beyond that date, four years from that date? Um, DOJ, of course, will take a list of everybody uh, who has those permits, and as a result, if you become prohibited, we'll yank that permit from you. Um, with and potentially without you even knowing it ahead of time until you go down to buy a firearm at a vendor and lo and behold the transaction gets held up because something didn't get removed correctly from your record. So there's always that area of concern as well. Um, you've got to be over the age of 18 and not prohibited from owning and possessing ammunition, which in other words is firearms. Um, DOJ is required to get that sucker to you within 30 days. Um, I'm sure they're probably going to wait to the 29th or 30 day to get that to you because that seems to be how long they're waiting and sometimes way beyond that point for all of the current um, applications and licenses um, that a lot of you may have been experiencing in either trying to get guns back or getting a certificate of eligibility um, or getting a type of dealer license or um, dangerous weapons permit. DOJ is kind of taking their sweet time when it comes to this stuff and DOJ can charge up to 50 bucks for this fee. Uh, depending on the processing cost, let's not kid ourselves, DOJ will charge you $50. Um, I don't think even when given the option to charge you less, um, any government agency ever has decided to take um, that option. No, they're going to charge you 50 bucks um, to do this. I would hope that's not the case, but chances are that's going to be the case when it comes to getting these permits. Um, and in moving forward, Another odd issue when it comes to Prop 63, um, usually you're dealing with, when you're dealing with state laws, um, you have a preemption issue, meaning that the state laws usually will trump, for lack of a better word, um, any state, I'm sorry, any local ordinance that would go into effect that would be either contradictory um, or be more um, restrictive than what the state law is. And not so much under Prop 63. It has specific language that says, hey, local, um, legislatures, hey, these cities, um, if you want to make these laws even more restrictive than what we're coming up with, by all means, have at it. Um, as a result, um, some of those, again, not so friendly uh, locations in California um, would be more than welcome to go ahead and get even more restrictive and uh, be more uh, prohibiting in the acquisition of ammunition if they were to choose fit. And we wouldn't have the ability to say, hey, we have a preemption issue because this is what Prop 63 says. Oh, no, quite the contrary. Prop 63 says go at it. Um, and so that's there, there's that area of concern uh, when we're talking about Prop 63. Um, uh, the differences between SB 1235, and like I said, I've, I've hit some of those, but some of those other ones I have did not mention. Uh, under Prop 63, dealers are required to report the theft of a loss of a round of ammunition uh, to law enforcement, um, which if you think about it is really ridiculous than that. If a vendor were to open up a box of, say, 50 uh, rounds and they only have 49 and there's a hole there uh, where the 50th round is supposed to be, um, I'm guessing, or at least I would be advising the vendor to say, well, CALF, or at least Prop 63 requires you, you got to look look, let local law enforcement know that there's been a round uh, lost or stolen from that box um, every single time that happens. Uh, the daily owned bill doesn't have that ridiculous requirement in it. Unfortunately for us, Prop 63 does. Uh, the daily owned bill does modify the permit process. And again, we don't know exactly which one's going to be controlling when these things um, all pan out and if Prop 63 passes. Uh, the De Leon bill modifies Prop 63 if Prop 63 passes to have the same background check or pretty much identical background check to what is in De Leon's bill if Prop 63 does not pass. And I'll explain. The background check contemplated by Senator De Leon in his bill isn't a permitting process. It's a process in which when you go to purchase ammunition, the California Department of Justice does a background check on you, but it's a little odd in how they do it. They check the automated firearm system, which is the system in which fi uh, individuals in California have their firearms registered typically when they are acquired from a licensed firearm dealer, and of course, depending on when that transaction occurred, there may be no firearms um, in that person's name in the automated firearm system. Nevertheless, when you go to purchase the ammunition, 
DOJ will check to see if you have a firearm registered to you in the automated firearm system. If you do have a firearm registered to you in the automated firearm system, they then check to determine whether or not you're in the Arm Prohibited Person System or APPS system. APPS is basically the system in which uh, people who are prohibited from owning and possessing firearms are cross-referenced with those people who have firearms registered to them in the automated firearm system, that system I just mentioned. If they do, then they are on the APPS list. They are on the Armed Prohibited Person System list. DOJ, in doing the background check for the ammunition, will check to see if you have a firearm registered to you, and then as a result, hey, have you come back prohibited from owning and possessing firearms? And if not, congratulations, here's your ammunition. If not, and if not meaning you're either prohibited or you don't have or a firearm registered to you, you got yourself a bit of a problem. Obviously, if you're prohibited, uh, the vendor is going to say, take a hike. If you don't have a firearm registered to you because you've never purchased a handgun uh, from a dealer in the state of California or registered one upon acquisition from, say, an intrafamilial transaction, or you haven't purchased a long gun since January 1, 2014 from a licensed vendor, or haven't had the opportunity to register any firearms, or any other reason to get a firearm registered to you in the automated firearm system. As a result, you don't have a firearm registered to you in the automated firearm system. You do have the ability to make a single ammunition transaction with a background check. Um, Senator De Leon still doesn't know what that process would be. I'm relatively certain the California Department of Justice has no idea as of yet what that process would be. Uh, but nevertheless, there is that option under the De Leon bill itself and under um, Prop 63 as Senator De Leon has decided to modify it. And so there is that ability to, under the De Leon bill and as De Leon has modified Prop 63, to do a background check on somebody without them having a firearm registered to them and most certainly uh, not having to go through that that permit process, which Senator De Leon completely goes away with or gets rid of if Prop 63 passes and his bill um, takes effect modifying it. We get rid of the um, ammunition purchaser authorization permit and we have his modified background check in the alternative. And last but not least, if you have a certificate of eligibility, um, you'd be exempt from that weird background check process I just mentioned. And of course, the um, ammunition transaction um, background check for that one-time purchase. But which law is going to take priority? Remains to be seen. If I'm betting, I would assume potentially that De Leon's bill was going to modify 63 and that's what we're going to deal with. But again, we don't know necessarily that's going to be the case because Newsom has, like I said, um, come out and said that it, what De Leon has done isn't in the spirit of what he has envisioned. Again, how all this plays out remains to be seen, but nevertheless, we've given you both aspects here, um, the Newsom requirement and then the Newsom requirement as modified um, by good old Senator De Leon. Confiscating firearms from prohibited persons. Um, this is a interesting spin on um, a seizure process um, and transfer process that kind of already exists under California law for people who get convicted of crimes, um, but puts a heck of a lot more onus and ultimately, and I'm certain, cost on your local court when it comes to a situation where a person is convicted of a crime that prohibits them from owning and possessing firearm. First of all, if a person doesn't do or isn't comply with what I'm about to say, it allows the judges to seek a warrant to go seize that person's firearms um, in any event. Um, but what exactly is going to be required is a whole bunch of text. No, <laughs> what's going to be required is that when a person gets convicted of an offense that carries with it a firearm restriction, whether or not it's a felony um, or something that carries with it a 10-year restriction. So if you get into a brawl at a bar and you get a 242, which is a battery, Sorry to say, if you're convicted of that crime, it carries with it a 10-year firearm restriction in the state of California. If and once you're convicted, the court's required to say, here's a whole bunch of forms. And one of those forms is for you to list all of the firearms you own and have somebody pick those firearms up for you and then either sell them to a dealer, transfer them um, to law enforcement, or store them on your behalf. And that's it. And so once you have a conviction that prohibits you, you're needing to designate somebody to get rid of, in other words, all of the firearms that you've owned, spent a lifetime in collecting, 
um, as Senator, I'm sorry, as Lieutenant Governor De Leon is advising you to do. Um, and then not only that, while you go through that process, you're going to have a probation officer looking over your shoulder, making sure that you've done all of this right, because he or she then is going to report to the court whether or not this was done all correctly. And if there's any inkling that it was done incorrectly, not only can you be deemed with an infraction, but remember that warrant I mentioned a second ago? And there's the potential that the judge could basically seek a warrant, or the probation department can ask the judge to provide them with a warrant to go looking for the firearms that they believe, however mistakenly or not, that you still own. Um, and so while we don't have any issues with people who are truly dangerous um, and should not have firearms accessible or in their possession having to do this, but if you get somebody who's got a brawl, or bar brawl um, and for whatever reason get convicted of a simple battery in that situation, all of a sudden they're going to get well, legally hammered when it comes to the requirements of getting rid of or selling or surrendering uh, their firearms. Um, and so that is a huge area of concern. And me, of course, as a criminal defense attorney, amongst other things, um, as, is very concerned how, one, this is going to play out, um, and two, the additional time requirement um, and burden it's going to put not only on the courts, but also on a, a very overworked probation department um, who has very dif difficulty just staying on top of and monitoring um, those truly violent people that they need to monitor on parole or probation. Um, now they're going to have to be being the gun nannies when it comes to people who probably shouldn't have a firearm restriction anyway, but nevertheless have to go through this ridiculous process. Um, so that's just a let bit me, of that. I'm also noticing. Go right ahead, Chuck. So let me just let me add a little bit to this. Uh, you know, this sure. seems like, after all the other stuff, this seems like something that maybe doesn't apply uh, to you, and, 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 you know, unless you get in trouble, it shouldn't. I'll just give you a cautionary tale. We have had hundreds of people, good, good people, come through the office who have gone through a, a bad breakup, and uh, it's mostly uh, a situation where a woman uh, complains about uh, their a boyfriend or a husband or whatever uh, uh, threatening them or touching them. I mean, you'd be amazed at what can be considered, quote, domestic violence, close quote. Uh, it, it's not like battered wife syndrome. Uh, any kind of minor touching can be considered uh, domestic violence and can uh, you can find yourself in court. And the, the worst thing about this is every family lawyer uh, knows that the way to get leverage in a child custody or a divorce proceeding is to have the wife uh, or the husband, for that matter, uh, uh, claim that the uh, the their spouse threatened them or 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 touched them or d did whatever that triggers either a TRO, which you may not even get notice of, or a uh, some kind of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence allegation. And it, it is just, it has become a very politicized prosecution, much like DUIs were uh, years ago and still are. Uh, and it's a, a, a source of revenue for the courts in many respects. So if you're going through that kind of a breakup, a cautionary tale, just do not put yourself in a situation where there is uh, an opportunity for your uh, significant other to cause to call the police or blame you for something you're going to want to get out of the out of the environment where something could happen without a witness and uh, you know it's a it's a tricky call here exactly but I've seen an awful lot of people uh, victimized by by a, a politicized system and a, and a you know hell hath no fury like a woman scorned uh, so uh, be careful about that yeah, and I see a couple of questions um, come up. Um, one of them is addressed in the slide, um, but I'll address both. Uh, me as a criminal defense attorney, um, and if I'm seeing the writing, so to speak, on the wall when it comes to the potential of a plea and uh, as much as I try um, and as successful as we are, every once in a while we have a case uh, wherein the person or the prosecutor's position is so strong or the person is, to use a highly legal term, so screwed, um, that a firearm prohibiting offense is highly likely. Um, I would advise in situations like this that the firearms be transferred well in advance of this requirement because keeping in mind that this requirement is at the time of the plea for the person, and that's why I say when the person is quote-unquote convicted, 
um, of something that prohibits them from owning and possessing firearms, they have to go through this process. Well, if they have already transferred or sold their firearms to other family members legally, um, prior to this point, then I can look the judge in the eye and say, okay, what firearms are you talking about, judge? Because we don't have any firearms. We don't even have any situation here uh, where we're possessed anymore. They've been all lawfully transferred months ago or weeks ago or yesterday. Um, but nevertheless, it's something, that we'll be, been, it's something that we'll be training public defenders and criminal defense attorneys how to, how to address during these cases. Uh, and I just yeah. want to mention one other thing. I know that, and I respect people's uh, of anger, righteous fury over uh, the passage of, of these uh, bills by the legislature and this proposal, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's far easier than you might think to get dragged into the criminal justice system, and um, I know there's a whole uh, non-comply movement out there, and I, I, you know, that's people's choice. I'll just tell you how it typically goes down. The prosecutor will stack the charges against a defendant, uh, add multiple felonies, even if it's not doesn't warrant those felonies. They'll 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 stack the complaint, and then the person is. And I can't tell you how many times I've had clients who had to make this decision. The person is faced with the choice of pleading to a misdemeanor or going to trial and risking a felony conviction. And obviously, once you have a felony conviction, you can't own guns for the rest of your life. So it's. I don't think it's going to be a situation where you're going to have, if you decide to not comply with this, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be the guy who, who's uh, accused of saying everybody should comply. I, I mean, it's a personal choice, but you're going to be, anybody that, that this happens to is going to be put in a position where they have to make this Hobson's choice between risking a loss of felony, uh, a loss of a felony and a loss of gun rights for, for life or taking some kind of a lesser plea. And most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the clients, you know, uh, and I, our job is to give them options, not to necessarily make a recommendation one way or another, uh, but they choose to not take that risk. I don't think you're going to have the gun rights community rising up with, with torches and pitchforks and demonstrating outside the courthouse for, uh, for people who, who make these kinds of choices, even though I wish that were the case. Uh, gun owner engagement is a whole a different topic that, that – uh, you know, NRA and CRPA have been trying to get all gun owners engaged in the cause and making the phone calls and, and uh, sending letters or faxes or emails or whatever for many, many years. Veto Gun Mageddon showed that there is some level of gun owner engagement in the state, but really we need everybody to help increase that engagement by spreading the messages on social media and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking your friend to the range or whatever you can do, but definitely being involved in the political process, being informed because you get NRA, CRPA, email bulletins and, and action alerts and those kinds of things. I mean, the, really, the reality here is, and I'm, I'm waxing a little bit off topic, but uh, the reality here is that Bloomberg makes more in a year than the NRA has raised since it was founded. So think about that for a second. Bloomberg and, his, and the Billionaire Boys Club are the social engineers that are that are directing not just Prop 63, but the ballot initiative in Nevada, in Maine, in Oregon. They did one in Washington State. They're doing another one in Washington State. Uh, and we'll, we're looking at fighting back, and I suspect we will be fighting back with some ballot initiatives, uh, initiatives, not referendums. Veto Gunmageddon was a, ver a referendum uh, campaign, which uh, uh, NRA and CRPA, by the way, uh, Activated all their volunteers who are out there every weekend, not just during the signature collection process uh, for Veto Gun Again, They're out there every weekend. They have been for years. They will be for years, uh, uh, educating people and giving people information. And and uh, and we converted all those uh, tables into signature collection tables uh, during the Veto Gun Mageddon process. Once we we jumped on board, and it did take a couple of weeks to figure out what the heck was going on, but. Uh, in, the, in any event, gun owner engagement is key, and uh, uh, be careful. Uh, uh, be careful out there about taking a position one way or another on some of these things. Joe, were you finished on this slide? Uh, pretty much. There was one other question. Um, if you're living with somebody who owns and possesses their own firearms, much like any situation where you become prohibited anyway, um, they will be able to continue to keep and possess their firearms, but they're going to have to lock them away and make them totally inaccessible to you. And so while this restriction 
applies to you and these requirements apply to you. If you have a roommate or a spouse who has his or her separate firearms, they would still be able to keep them, but keeping in mind in any, like any situation where one member of the household becomes prohibited, um, that other member of the household who's not prohibited, um, is, I, as far as I'm concerned, required, <laughs> as California law is concerned, is also required um, to lock those away in a way that the prohibited person cannot gain access to it. I typically suggest in situations like this, um, caution is best and having those firearms stored in another location where the prohibited person is not and most certainly doesn't have access to is preferable just in case a situation involving a probation officer or follow-up investigation occurs you don't want to have to or have to hire an attorney to explain where for why and how that safe was inaccessible to the prohibited person um, and so therefore that person shouldn't be either charged with a prohibited person in possession charge and a potential probation or parole violation on top of that stuff. Uh, so there's that. Um, moving on to the last slide as far as um, my information goes. Um, this last portion of Prop 63 actually amends um, a previous prop, uh, proposition, Prop 47, which um, had previously increased um, the dollar value of items um, required for so-called petty theft. Um, petty theft was kicked up to uh, the dollar value of 950, and anything less than 950 was considered petty. Um, and as a result, the person would be charged with petty theft versus grand theft. Um, what the, the proponents of Prop uh, 47 failed to take into consideration that a number of firearms um, are also valued less than 950, and so therefore the theft of those firearms, much like anything else, less than $950 would also be considered petty theft as well. Um, Prop 63 would change that to say that this section does not apply to the theft of firearms. But showing you yet again how little consideration um, the drafters of Prop 63 took into consideration, uh, they also added that same code section, petty theft, into the offenses that carry with them a 10-year firearm restriction. And so if you're prosecuted for petty theft, um, if, the firearm being, or if it was a firearm that was taken, you, it will result in a 10-year firearm ban. But like I just said, and as the quoted language says above, this section does not apply to the theft of a firearm. So what exactly they did by making that violation for theft of a firearm a ban um, remains to be seen because it doesn't appear to be a 10-year ban at all because you can't be prosecuted for petty theft of a firearm. Um, but that's just a little inside baseball, again, of how little sometimes people take into consideration what they write and how they go about it when also, it comes to these laws in particular. Um, oh, go ahead, John. Keep, keep in mind that Gavin Newsom was the one who was be, one of the ones who was very much behind Prop 47 and all the decriminalization that of, 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 of offenses, including violent offenses in some cases that came about because of it. And he's also behind some of the propositions on the ballot right now that will lower the penalties and allow violent criminals to get out of the jail or prison. Uh, and one of the, my favorite arguments that the other side makes in the gun ban lobby makes in favor of Prop 63 is that it will, that gun laws have caused crime to go down in California. That's completely false. There's an article coming out in next month's firing line, the CRPA magazine, uh, that lays this all out. But in a nutshell, the crime rate started going down when we passed three strikes and 1020 life and some of the enhanced penalties that caused uh, uh, violent criminals to think twice about uh, pulling violent crimes, uh, and, and the gun laws had not, absolutely nothing to do with it. In fact, we have more gun laws on our books right now, and the crime is now going back up again because uh, we have a, a problem with gangs and, and, and drug dealers uh, that causes that, that spike in crime uh, in California. So uh, Interesting reading. There's a lot about it on the internet too. John Lott has done a lot about this, but this is the biggest lie that's being pushed by the, the folks that want to ban civilian possession of firearms eventually. There's also a bunch of questions being asked about, um, about uh, litigation, and I'm going to jump to the next slide now. Uh, there will be lawsuits, no doubt, challenging some of these laws. Again, I put out uh, something on the, on the bulletin board here on the chat. Uh, flow here, uh, talking about the 
the consequences of the presidential election and how the Supreme Court is going to be stacked. Uh, uh, Trump has identified a number of, ca of judicial candidates that he would put on the court. The, the, the reality of the situation is I've been involved in pretty much every Second Amendment case since 2008 when the Heller decision first came down, and I have seen how uh, the judges that are in the Obama-Clinton line of thinking camp will bend over intellectually backwards to limit the restrictions that Heller places on governments from infringing on the right to keep and bear arms. And that's who she's going to stack that court with. Uh, so that court, the Supreme Court, newly constituted with, with uh, Clinton's appointees, will, will gut the Heller decision. Uh, pro they'll probably start try and make it homebound so that the right to keep and bear arms only applies inside your house. And then they'll apply a low level of scrutiny that will effectively make it impossible to challenge those gun laws because there will be such a deference to the state, to the government, in what they try and do to, uh, to restrict your rights. Uh, anyway, for more information, I'm going to let Joe take a minute and look through some of these questions, and he can see if he wants to answer any before we sign off. But for more information on Prop 63 and on SB 1235, you've got the links here. This webinar will be posted on the CRPA website probably by tomorrow. Uh, ben, do you know when? Um, we'll try to get it up as soon as possible, but hopefully tomorrow. Okay. Uh, also, I want to recommend that there's a lot of calls, a lot of uh, questions coming through about gun laws in general, and I just can't get to all of those today. Uh, if you guys want to send questions, follow-up questions, uh, where are we having them send them, Ben? Contact at uh, CRPA.org, right? Correct. Contact at crpa.org. Also, the, the the book Joe and I are, are finished, and Ben are finishing, uh, the fourth edition will be out, and it'll have everything about Prop 63 plus all the new bills. You can get in a, you, if you pre-order it now from the CRPA, it'll probably be out in November, uh, hopefully by Thanksgiving. Um, you will get a preview of uh, all the bills that have passed. They'll send you a booklet that previews everything, and then when the book finally comes out in finished form, you can throw that preview away because everything will be in the book and they'll send you the book uh, you know, as soon as it's available. So, and there's a portion of that that's, uh, that gets donated to the CRPA. So uh, believe me, I don't make any money off this book. I, I just get it out there because there's so many people with so many questions because California's gun laws are now as complicated as California's tax and environmental laws. And the big difference is uh, you, you know, with all the complicated regulatory schemes that California has, the one that, that really hurts people the most that I see most, the, the most accidental violations of are the gun laws because gun owners don't have, you know, a gun lawyer standing in their clothes closet rather, regularly to give, rather, ready to give them regulatory compliance advice. Unlike, you know, a corporation that has to comply with tax or environmental laws, they have regulatory compliance counsel uh, either on staff or on retainer that tells them how to not to, how to not break the law. So it's really a sad situation. They keep piling these laws on in the name of stopping criminals from getting easy quote unquote easy access to firearms, which has never been uh, less true. Uh, you know, back in the '60s, <clears throat> you could uh, order a a gun shipped to your doorstep through the Sears catalog, and kids took guns on the school bus to go compete in the rifle team. So accessibility isn't the issue. Anyway, I'm waxing philosophic again. Uh, think about buying this book. Uh, it answers a lot of questions. It's an indispensable reference, I think. Uh, some upcoming webinars, a uh, lot of questions about loaning and juniors programs. We're working on it. We want to get it out there. Boy Scouts 4-H uh, and, and juniors training programs, they will be able to continue to be done. We just have to get a webinar together that tells you how. Uh, so you can subscribe to the alerts and get that information. There's also those other three webinars on the bottom there on the, on the bills that passed that are available. So you'll be able to, again, go back and freeze these screens on the, uh, you can fast forward through them and, screen, and s freeze them on the, uh, on the uh, recorded version. And the last thing I'd say is please, once again, uh, your, some of you will be getting our polling questions please, please help us out by answering those and sending them on back to us. Uh, we really do want to know who our audience is and work on that gun owner engagement, see what things uh, folks like everybody listening care about, and, 
and participate in so we can try and reach out to more and more and more people and get them engaged in the fight for all of our right to keep and bear arms and for uh, you know for the sake of our our uh, ourselves and our children and our friends and and our future uh, you know to protect this freedom that I think everybody on this call uh, except for those few folks who are probably on there from the Newsom campaign those a couple of trolls um, uh, believe in so thank you for for listening today and uh, and if you have questions or suggestions or anything else uh, contact at crpa.org and uh, we'll try and get back to you as quickly as we can. Bear with us. We're swamped at the moment. We're getting a lot of questions about these laws. That's why we're trying to, to kind of put them all together in seminars. Uh, Joe, did you have any questions that jumped out on you that you want to answer before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I saw a couple of them that um, uh, we've received in the past um, and there are duplicates here. Um, I'm assuming uh, and I hope DOJ is clever enough to assume correctly that if the um, AFS check um, is the way to do the background check, not only is it going to be done automatically um, as it's required to be, um, and yes, that means them doing the check while the person's standing in the store to confirm that that person has a firearm registered to them in the system and um, is not on the apps list, or if that's not the case, and then to flip the script and say, okay, here's the information or the form to do the single purchase, uh, single time uh, purchase of ammunition. So that is required to be done when the person is quite literally standing in that store. Also, um, as is often the case, a person will probably have more firearms uh, that they own than is actually registered to them in the automated firearm system. I may or may not be one of them. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that should not restrict the types of ammunition or the amounts of ammunition you were to purchase. So if, say, if a person has handguns and only handguns registered to them in the automated firearm system, however, they acquired a whole slew of long guns, rifles, or shotguns prior to January 1st, 2014, um, and uh, was then purchasing a bunch of 308 and 12-gauge. Uh, there shouldn't be any issues with that. That person has a firearm registered to them in the automated firearm system, and as a result, um, can go ahead and purchase ammunition, any types of ammunition. Of course, if it's not something it's illegal to acquire in California, like tracer rounds or flechette. Um, but nevertheless, it should be allowed that person to purchase any types of ammunition uh, when it comes to those firearms. And yeah, I, I can certainly see a situation where law enforcement, when they're looking for somebody or really interested in somebody, saying, hey, this person only has handgun ammunition um, or handguns registered to them. Why are they buying a whole bunch of 7.62 or 2.23? We might want to talk to them. Um, I would hope that wouldn't be the case where they're just making random ab approaches. It would probably most certainly be a waste of their time in almost all situations. Um, but nevertheless, yes, I can see that being used in certain law enforcement situations, but it should most certainly should not be questioned um, by DOJ when someone's purchasing uh, ammunition um, for uh, firearms that are not registered to them um, because that's not the requirement, and then go pound sand, law enforcement. Um, I saw another question relating to um, retired law enforcement. No, unfortunately, under um, the... The Prop 63, there is no exception for law, uh, retired law enforcement background checks when it comes to this stuff, um, and so you're still going to be subject to the permitting process, um, at least for Prop 63. Um, da, 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 uh, forgive me, I'm going through my notes. Um, oh, spousal transfers and sales of ammunition. One thing I didn't key on, and I apologize for the people who probably have already left, but I'll touch on it here. Um, a lot of the ammo restrictions that I've mentioned, the vendor licenses, the background check, um, the personal purchaser information, all of those relate to the sales of ammunition. Still, the only restriction uh, relating to the transfer or the giving of ammunition is the face-to-face -face one. Um, and so if you're giving ammunition, uh, you may still do so freely. There is also an exception for spouses um, and immediate family members meaning parents, grandparents, children, and grandchildren, uh, you're exempt from a number of the requirements relating to sales. And so if I wanted to sell my father um, ammunition, I do have an exemption available to me, and, which is why I mentioned 
And in my hypothetical, I mentioned to other people in our office, if I'm selling ammunition to them, I'm not related to any of them, as far as I know. Um, and so as a result, that transaction would need to go through a licensed um, fire, I'm sorry, a licensed vendor. Um, and so there's that. Um, and no, the, uh, the ammunition registry should not be available to the public. It's um, available to law enforcement only. Um, that is under both um, Newsom and under De Leon. Um, and is there two stages of ammunition purchase? Um, technically, yes. Um, you have the vendor and the face-to-face -face requirement. Um, and, um, and I don't know if I highlighted that. The um, importer, the, the residents importing ammunition you acquire from outside the state. I don't think I did, and I apologize for that. I might have just got lost in one of the slides. Um, all of those requirements will go into effect, the face-to-face, -face, the, the going through a vendor requirement, and the personal importer of ammunition. Um, or I'm sorry, California resident, I should call it, classify that as uh, importer of ammunition. Those all go into effect um, January 1st, 2018. However, the background check and the, um, the personal uh, purchaser information, um, that goes into effect July 1st, 2019. So there is a bit of a two-step process when it comes to this stuff. We have some of those requirements going into effect on January 1st, um, 2018, the vendor requirement, the face-to-face -face requirement, if you're ordering it over um, the internet, all of those, and then the background check requirements and the uh, or the permit requirement, depending on which law uh, trumps, uh, again, so to speak, um, and um, the the, pers uh, the purchaser information um, requirement, those go into effect July 1st, 2019. Um, I think that does about does it for me. Um, and so again, thank you all for your um, interest. We're going to keep the um, the chat log open for a little bit longer after I sign off as well. So if you have additional questions, um, we can go ahead and please go ahead and fill them in there. We're not going to do a, a Q and A. I don't believe we're going to do a, Q, um, a frequently asked questions um, like we did um, for the previous webinars because um, we're getting so close to both the book being published. Um, and there's still some question with relating to whether or not these things are becoming or will go into effect as a result of the um, vote this coming November. So I don't think we're going to have a frequently asked questions, but please provide them anyway um, because they often um, we either provide us um, things or hypotheticals or information that we may need to include the, into the book or situations that are unique that we feel we need to address. We've already put a lot of that stuff in your previous questions from past webinars um, into the book uh, relating to um, how they apply to everyday citizens and things along those lines. And so those are and continue to be very helpful um, when it comes to that stuff. Um, and again, if you have any questions relating to or concerns uh, relating to the bills that passed in July, Again, I did three webinars. You can hear my dulcet tones. Um, sorry. Again, on those, those webinars are on CRPA's website. And again, they are discussed everything, regardless of Newsom um, passes or not. Um, all of uh, what's pending next year will be in Chuck's book. If Newsom passes, um, we're already addressing those issues. If it doesn't, we got us a whole lot of deleting to do, um, but we're happy to do it. Uh, nevertheless, I think that does it for me. Again, thank you all for signing on. Um, take care. And like I said, we'll keep the chat box open for another five minutes or so for additional questions um, for us to go ahead and review. And like I said, I'm not going to be able to address them, but um, we could probably deal with them in the book. Um, thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.